Hi, everybody. I'm Anthony Accardo from Disney ABC Television Group. Uh, I lead the research and development team. And so among things like VR and AR and animation technology, one of the major focuses of the last few years has been metadata. And the reason that's, that's true is because if you look at broadcast networks and their history, uh, the purpose of R&D is to try and disrupt those, those traditional businesses. And the biggest, most obvious disruption of a broadcast network is a digital video platform. And so when we started looking at how to use digital video platforms to disrupt broadcast television, we kept running into roadblocks and problems, and that's because we didn't have good metadata. And so then we embarked on a very long journey of trying to figure out how do we really position metadata as a core strategy and a core competency of our company. And that's where we ended up with our main project that we're going to speak about, which is to build a metadata platform. It allows us to compete with digital video platforms. And key to that is consolidating taxonomy, tagging and annotation, and publication of that metadata. And we're going to talk a little bit today about how we've evolved over the past few years, what the specific use cases are, and how we've, we've created an architecture that we think, we think will future-proof us and allow us to switch out various automation technologies leveraging machine learning. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is taxonomy versus metadata. So taxonomy would be the governance, the origin of the terms, the fact that we're going to use one spelling of a name to refer to that person, um, whereas metadata is actually the application of those taxonomies to a bunch of content. And so I put up a quote by Neil Gaiman, who basically said that you know, Google can get you 100,000 answers, but a librarian can bring the right one. Based on the use for the metadata, this is extremely crucial. So if I'm just trying to search through a big archive of content and pull back a few things that might or might not be relevant, that's one thing. But if I'm trying to serve a consumer experience, where we're trying to tell you about our content, we have to be 100% accurate. And if I'm trying to do data science, we also have to make sure that our metadata is ext has extreme levels of integrity. So taxonomy becomes incredibly important. And the second core principle of the strategy that we've created is platform, not application. So, when we began to investigate the space, we started taking vendor meetings. And in, indeed, we see you know, a, a thousand startups. We see the big tech companies in the last year or two um, coming with a lot of services to extract metadata. Um, and if the only reason why you care about metadata is for one specific application, for search, then you're fine. You don't need to worry about a metadata platform. But we feel that metadata is so critical and so important to our future of our business that we want to build a platform that future-proofs us and allows us to use the same core set of metadata for any number of use cases. And so you know, the two main examples that we've been talking about within the company is if you look at Walmart.com versus Amazon.com, two huge retailers. Walmart.com, which had legacy physical stores and still continues to, that, that's their main business, um, they decided they wanted to start selling product on the internet. So they created Walmart.com, which in its sort of implementation was largely a very strong e-commerce application, but it was not a platform like Amazon built. And Amazon has this sort of e-commerce platform. They used the book sales application to build. Now they're, they're able to launch businesses left and right. They've got the entire supply chain down for e-commerce. They've got machine learning for personalization of your experience. And that's kind of the world that we want to be in, is building a platform that you can just launch businesses left and right. Additionally, you can look at MySpace versus Facebook. MySpace is a social media platform that connects people, um, or application that connects people. And Facebook basically wanted to own identity on the internet. And you can see what's happened over the past decade. Essentially, Facebook is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And that's because it's connected all across the internet, not just within the Facebook application. So our main, our main use cases that drive the platform are, first, operational, to save time and money. 
So an example that I've got listed here, show me all the times that Olivia Pope in Scandal was in an argument at the White House. Um, this helps create promos. This helps do research when writing new shows. Um, this helps with social media marketing and saves a ton of time and effort. We also want to personalize our digital platforms. And this is one of the key, um, key components to our strategy is we want to be able to use recommendation engines and not have to rely on vendor technology all the time and come with our own data to make those recommendation engines better. We want to create experiences that use the digital platform in ways that you can't with broadcast. Broadcast is a one-to-many technology. And so as of today, for the most part, watching an episode of TV on your iPad is exactly the same as watching an episode of TV on your television. And why is that? Watching TV on an iPad is one-to-one. -one. There are so many infinite possibilities of what you can do with that technology platform um, that are not being leveraged. And we think metadata is a critical enabler to those experiences. And then we want to use that data to predict performance without going into telling creatives what to write, which is a sacred responsibility that we don't want data to interfere with. What we want to use data for is to essentially help us on the network side or even on the studio side decide what to invest in. And once something is created, help us predict how successful it's going to be. So here's an example of an implementation of some of the metadata. And this is that search that I was mentioning. This is a search which shows you in scandal how many times Olivia Pope has been in an argument in the White House. And here's another example. Here's a recommendation engine feature uh, for similar shows. And this wasn't you know, licensed from a vendor or you know, something that, that, that we're locked into. This is essentially you, to us just using our own basic metadata um, to improve the experience on our digital platforms. So here's a snapshot of the architecture that we've created which will allow us to essentially pivot to any metadata use case and swap out any metadata technology that comes on the market. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the ontology. And that's kind of the foundation of this whole thing. We use graph data. And the ontology is essentially the set of rules that govern the entire world. So an episode on the descriptive side has rules about it that belongs to a season which belongs to a series, and it has acts and scenes, and those scenes have characters, and there are storylines that go across. And so fleshing this out and describing the world of the episode allows you then to create the metadata, which then falls into that ontology and allows you to do things. It's a very structured way um, to create value, again, according to use cases. And so the three applications that primarily support our architecture are the taxonomy application. And this really is just lists of terms. So it's, it's authority lists, which are like people names or episode titles. Um, and it's a single version of that name with a single unique identifier. Uh, and then any variant terms can be sort of associated with that unique identifier, but it allows us to link our data across entire ecosystems. And then there are controlled vocabularies, which are sort of generic terms, like a chair or a table or a kidnapping plot line. Um, or a protective character archetype. These are things that don't change, and so they allow you to do comparisons and analysis across large swaths of content. That taxonomy application feeds into an annotation platform that we built called Map3, which is a media an annotation platform. And when we began, uh, we did this entirely manual. So we create a, a task. We upload video and ingest taxonomy and control vocabularies. Then we assign humans to go in and annotate the video. And then we have a QA workflow. And then that data is validated and sent down into the metadata repository. Um, but that platform is the key component to why we feel that our solution is modular, future-proof, and helps us avoid vendor lock-in. Because the piece missing that we've always seen when we take vendor meetings or when we look at technologies that just apply machine learning and neural nets to large groups of video is that they don't account for a specific organization, how metadata is used within that organization, and how governance and structure and storage and archival of the metadata itself is valuable. And so what we've done is we've created this tagging platform that allows us to essentially drop in 
different machine learning algorithms, but it stays within our own infrastructure. So we govern the data, not the algorithms. And then the metadata repository is the final piece of our architecture, which is just a big brain. And this is a fairly new concept. It's kind of like a metadata, uh, a master data management uh, repository. Um, but it just holds descriptive metadata about the content at the creative work level. So this isn't about the asset. This isn't metadata in a DAM system. It's not associated to video. Because in our world, what is a video, right? We have distribution to digital platforms. We have broadcast assets. We have airline assets. We have hundreds of different languages. And so the gap there between DAM systems and master data management systems is really this metadata repository, which stores a master single set of creative metadata. And then the things on the bottom of the screen are in green are three applications um, that we've launched and three enabling technologies. So even before we start into the machine learning side, uh, this is comes as, as a surprise to some, which is that 100% manual tagging of video content with good workflow and good architecture is fairly efficient uh, before you even begin layering in the automation. And so right now, we're at about $235 of manual tagging cost per hour of content. And what we're getting in that scope of tags um, is fairly substantial and it's fairly helpful. Um, I mean, we've looked at, at calling some machine learning algorithms that generate the same metadata, and the price isn't that different. I mean, when you start looking at having to send every frame into a machine learning algorithm and, and pull back data, it can be quite expensive. Um, and so, but that's not good enough for us. We definitely want to and have been leveraging machine learning, um, but I think it, it does come as a surprise as well as the fact, the very important fact, um, and without this we wouldn't be doing this, there are many things that are incredibly valuable that cannot be automated today and that probably will not be automated over the next several decades. And these are things like storylines, character traits, motivations, things that allow you to do incredibly detailed uh, analysis and data science. They also enable you to build really cool uh, customer facing features out of your content and the platform allows the generation of that type of metadata not to be a one-off thing I have this idea to create this one thing so let's go spend a bunch of money creating the metadata it just is generated as a result of our content operation so now that you've seen the strategy and the basic infrastructure we're going to talk about how we're using machine learning today and I have to apologize as this is not my area of expertise and our engineer based in Switzerland that's leading this is the one that really can speak in detail, um, but I have spent many long hours studying his notes, so I will try and do him justice. So here are our core values, that we don't want vendor lock-in on character recognition or object detection. Uh, we want to use our manual tagging platform to benefit the process of getting metadata out of these algorithms. And we want this to be extensible to any media asset from any system. So here is an example of what would be the most generic, simplest uh, automation workflow. You've got training data, you've got a recognition algorithm, and then you recognize. So if you want to change your recognition algorithm, you essentially have to start all over and build new training data with the new training algorithm, recognition algorithm, and then you have to recognize. And then by the way, you probably have sets of competing data if you're lucky enough to be able to get the data out of the vendor that you used. So here's where we've innovated. We added two key components to the workflow. Number one is a data set manager. This is incredibly important. This is essentially an index of all of the training data that we sent to every, or every machine learning algorithm. This includes um, metadata, it includes screenshots and headshots, and it even includes some sample algorithms that help us, for example, choose the right frame to send to the recognition algorithm. Then it goes to the recognition algorithm, and as the output, we get a taxonomy conversion. Because if you remember to our core principles, our taxonomy is incredibly important across all of our use cases. So if we're using WordNet, that may or may not map to our taxonomy. So we have a section in our workflow that does that mapping so the data we get out of these algorithms works within our ecosystem. 
And then finally, we have this, this recognize piece, this robot piece, which allows us to essentially put this on top of our tagging platform and assign tasks. So in a single episode metadata workflow, you could, for example, say, I want to use this algorithm to do scene splitting. I want to use a different algorithm to do face detection. I want to use this other al algorithm to do action recognition. And you just press a button, and that happens, right? And it sends certain, certain uh, tasks to certain algorithms. It sends other tasks to humans. It creates QA tasks. And essentially, you have this incredibly complex um, uh, operation of generating rich descriptive metadata uh, extremely efficient through the workflow engine. So exactly what are we leveraging? Um, this is another thing when you look at, at, at vendors coming to you with solutions for using machine learning against your video content, um, usually they focus on one or two things. And so Building our own platform with our own architecture gives us the flexibility to experiment with a number of things that may not be within the sort of core competencies of vendor A, B, or C. And it allows us not to have to go to vendors you know, A, B, C, D, and E. And so what we've done is we've taken uh, character recognition algorithms that are best in class and state of the art, and we've implemented those. Um, the, each one of these boxes represents some, some new technologies. Green is something that's been implemented. Uh, yellow is basically in process. And actions are sort of at the beginning, or the red is at the beginning of the phase of implementation. And so we're doing places. We're doing objects. We're using a lot of, of neural nets, by some, some from MIT, some from Microsoft, some within Disney. And then authorities extraction is something that's incredibly important. That's actually generating the taxonomies out of upstream materials. So rather than going through your video and generating metadata, this helps us train the algorithms um, from things like scripts and production documents. And then two things that we've seen uh, need a lot of work are actions and then scene segmentation. And one of the really cool things that we're, we've begun to do that has allowed us to start working on these more effectively is we've started doing multimodal machine learning. So one thing that looks at you know, computer, it's computer vision based algorithm to detect faces basically just uses the video. Um, action detection algorithms just use the video. But if you can start using um, data that comes out of facial recognition as well as data that comes out of places as well as data that comes out of um, authorities like scripts, you can then begin to chip away at some of these harder problems like what is a scene, which is an incredibly difficult thing for a computer to generate. It's easy to say this is a shot because the camera changes angles and you know there's new people, but a scene has a lot of context. It has a lot of um, human element to it. And so by using multimodal machine learning, we're able to start cracking down on that. And how does this stuff get get really good accuracy? Well, it goes back to the human element. We are sending the results of these algorithms through our manual tagging platform to be QA'd, therefore creating incredibly clean sets of training data, which is the single most important thing to get accuracy. When you hear 99.9% .9 accurate facial recognition, that means you've got an incredibly accurate set of data that is powering that recognition algorithm. Uh, so the same algorithm with bad data would probably not be 99.9% .9 accurate. So this shows you know, that these are results that you're seeing from a uh, place recognition algorithm. And it's a QA or going through, clicking on each one of them to make sure that they're accurate, and then going in and either accepting them or rejecting them. And so the amount of investment that you have to do to this to actually get really good at results has a very high ROI. Same thing with object recognition. So in this particular example, we're using Microsoft Research residual neural nets. So to sort of summarize what we're doing in terms of our engineering focus is first, with the recognition algorithms, we're not focusing too much on them, because you can see the little meter is in the green. 
Um, if you have good data, the state of the art for recognition algorithms is pretty good for a lot of things. What's not so good is the ability to recognize these with bad data. And so we've been spending a lot of time on things like even what, what shots do we send to get better outcomes of the recognition algorithms. And training data is where we spend most of our time. So using the QA loop in our tagging platform um, to create incredibly rich data sets. We're also doing things like taking sparse tags that are generated by taggers and using machine learning to generate dense data sets. Right? So if a manual tagger goes in and says, that's Tom Cruise, and does it once, and Tom Cruise is in that scene you know, 400 times in terms of per frame, then an algorithm can take that one annotation and say, here's 400 instances of Tom Cruise, and that's incredibly helpful when it comes to training, training your algorithms. But I think the key for us is even using the machine learning and the machine algorithms to help our QAers by saying, no, you actually did a bad job QAing that. And so it's a, it's a virtuous cycle that we're relying on. And so that's, uh, that's our discussion. That's the, the end of the machine learning work that we're doing, uh, and we're going to continue to try and innovate in the space. <laughs>